Hey Ruganath, tell everyone about our Patreon community. Sure, Kostuba. The Wisdom of the Sages Patreon community is an incredible online yoga resource. If you like the type of yoga wisdom and culture we share on the show, then our Patreon community is a great next step. This is a listener-supported podcast, and any level of sponsorship will unlock a wide range of live and archive classes, talks, and even workshops. Raghunath teaches, I teach, and we have a host of other excellent teachers on topics ranging from yoga philosophy, asana classes, storytelling, Ayurveda, kirtan, cooking, meditation, and a lot more. We even have an incredible online bhakti 12-step recovery group. So if you want to check it out, go to patreon.com slash wisdom of the sages. All right, let's get it on. Kana, New York, this is Wisdom of the Sages, a daily yoga podcast. With your host, Raghunath, and co-host and senior educator at the Bhakti Center in New York, Kostuba Das. Welcome to the show, everybody. I'm live in Mara's car today. Welcome, everybody, for our special 1,000th episode with his special guest, His Holiness Radhanaswamy. We're excited for this. 1,000 episodes in Kostuba. And before we bring on His Holiness, do you have any announcements or you want to say anything, Kostuba? I don't have any announcements. I'm just happy to be here. Happy to be here with you and Mara, you know, for episode 1000. I'm very grateful to all the listeners. We have over 200 people with us this morning, live, 223 right now. Uh, we're all very grateful for you all tuning in every day. And thank you for all coming this morning. We got hit by a snowstorm last night. Mara's car froze. I couldn't get into it. I got the kids in my house. My internet's dead. So I'm live, okay. on, the side, I'm live on the side of the road. Business <laughs> <laughs> but um, it's great to have Zoom so packed out, doubled this morning, and as well as the thousands of other listeners out there. And Radhana Swami has been a guest on the show before, and he always brings light to our life. Uh, I can speak for Kostuba. I think it's safe to say that um, even though we don't see Maharaj all the time, we always feel like he's with us all the time because we think sure. about him on a regular basis. He's a directing force in wisdom of the sages and our, and, you know, in our personal lives and our, in our personal joys and our personal direction. And we can't even begin to explain how in debt we are to him. Um, Mara, do you have any announcements you want to get out, get out? Uh, yeah, we have a back to recovery group meeting today at noon. Tomorrow morning, Josh Kane has an asana class for our Patreon members at 10 30 AM. And we also have the one day passes live on our website now for the uh, May retreat with His Holiness Sachinandana Swami. And that's yeah. at wisdomofthesages.com slash events. Thank you, Mara. Mara, what episode, down, how many downloads have got? We looked at the some statistic yesterday. What was the, how many oh, downloads? The one on Libsyn. I, uh, Kasuba, do you know that off the top of your head? I, I don't know, but it's well over 5 million. Five million um, yeah. that's, and that's just the audio. That's not the video downloads and all that. So let's keep this going, people. Let's just, let's just keep telling friends and let this thing grow organically. It's a new age, and it's time to spread the Srimad Bhagavatam. The world needs it now more than ever. Is Maharaj on the show? I can only see. I'm doing this through my iPhone today. Yes. Maharaj is here, although Maharaj, w welcome. But we can't see you right now. Your, your picture isn't on. There we go. Thank you so much, Maharaj, for coming this morning. I don't see him. Could you share a word, Maharaj, just so that we know that the audio is working? I am so happy to be with you. Thank you, Maharaj. <laughs> So, so uh, you know, I think everybody here knows Radna Swami. I think we, we know about you know um, his New York best New York Times best-selling books, "The Journey Home," "The Journey Within." We know about so many wonderful projects that he's spearheaded, like the Govardhan Eco Village, the the Bhaktivedanta Hospital in Mumbai, the the community in Mumbai, the uh, the, the Radha Gopinath Temple, and he's beyond all that. He's just uh, he, he's a guiding light for us. He's a person that deeply embodies everything that we speak about every day about the practice of bhakti yoga. 
uh, he's and he's very dear to all of us who was in the Sages. So we're so happy to have you here. And um, Maharaj, we want to do an interview with you. We've interviewed other people this way in the past. It's it's kind of a it's based. I don't know. Did have you ever read the book The Prophet Maharaj by Khalil Gibran? Um, fifty four years ago. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so we're kind of doing I don't know how well you remember it but it, it's it, it's a story of a of a man who's uh lived for quite some time in one land and uh he's really appreciated and loved by the local people for his wisdom but uh, the book opens up with a boat is coming and it's the boat that he's going to get on the next day and and leave that place forever and all the people come to him and they're asking him to share some wisdom on just different important topics on the you can say the human condition. And uh, we thought we would interview that you that way just by asking you some very general questions and, and allowing you to speak your your thoughts on them. Um, so are, are you ready to go, Maharaj? Well, I'm I'm right now in Mumbai, just one block from Chopati Beach. So it's close to the shore where the boats are. <laughs> okay. Well, please don't go anywhere yet. <laughs> but uh, I'm I'm sincerely honored and grateful to be with all of you today. Thank you. Thank Raghunath, you. Raghunath, for... would you like to ask the first question? Yeah, Maharaj. Um, a lot of us have been have have good friends in our life and have had. Um, sometimes you know, on our spiritual path, we realize, well, that friendship that I had was not so good for me that was sort of a degrading friendship how would you explain friendship on a spiritual path what is what is real friendship as opposed to material friendship or is there a difference in a general way friendship is to be a friend or to have a friend is to be sincerely well-wishing. A friend is a sincere well-wisher. In, in Sanskrit, the word paradukaduki is often used, which means that a spiritually oriented person is one who another person's sorrow is my sorrow and another person's happiness is my happiness. And really that's at the very heart of friendship. <laughs> to, to genuinely care about each other's well-being and to see our relationship from the larger perspective where we're not distracted by the little habits and the little disagreements and the little um, differences of ego that we may have or even you know to see beyond the mistakes we make in our relationships in the bhagavad gita Krishna tells, Suhradam Sarva Bhutanam. This is one of the most primary features of God when, when the Lord comes into this world, is he's everyone's ever well-wishing friend. Yada yada hi dharmasya glanir bhavati bharata. What type of friend is Krishna or God, whatever name we may, we may call upon? The Lord descends into this world again and again and again. It is described in the Vedic literatures that as there are waves in an ocean, that is how God has descended into this world through the ages. 
Um, the word avatar means one who descends. And why does the Lord descend again and again? No matter what we've done, he comes to give us wisdom, to bestow upon us blessings, whatever we've done or not done in the past. He's giving us another chance. In this way, Krishna is a supreme friend. And from a spiritual perspective, the most complete and fulfilling form of friendship is without egoism, without selfish motivation, to try to bring each other closer to God's love. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Maharaj. That was beautiful. We have another question for you. Could you please share your thoughts on forgiveness? It, it has been said that love is everlasting forgiveness. When we truly love someone, that empowers us. <laughs> to forgive. Um, just recently, I visited my 99-year-old father. <laughs> he's, you know, he's, he's very ill at this time. And while I was sitting at his bedside, I was thinking, of all the things I did in my life, I'm almost 73 now, that he could not understand that actually really hurt him. But it doesn't really make that much difference because where there's love, there's natural forgiveness. Um, and we read about within spiritual histories and holy scriptures, perhaps the most primary feature of a person close to God is their forgiveness. Prahlad, Ambarish, Nityananda Prabhu, Jagayan Madhai. Um, Haridas Thakur, Lord Jesus Christ, um, their power to forgive was an expression of their love for God. Um, when we see each other from the bodily concept or just the emotional or egoistic perception, then we can have very serious issues with people that are very difficult to forgive. And that is a reality in the human experience. But as we go deeper spiritually and we understand that I'm an eternal soul, I'm a part of God, and God loves every soul, <laughs> <laughs> that gives us the power to be transformed with positive change in such a way that we can forgive ourselves. And it also gives us the power to see another person from their spiritual perspective in God's love for them, which um, is truly the empowering element of spiritual forgiveness. To see the potential in others. And for there to be true friendship, there needs to be um, this element of humility, tolerance, and forgiveness in our interactions with each other. That is not only the reason, it's the culmination of our spiritual development, but trying to live in that 
spirit is also the process of spiritual growing. Thank you, Marsh. That's beautiful. We're going to have to we, want to take... Oh, please. We have, we have a tendency to hold on to little things. Mm. And if we're not... If we're not If we're not taking shelter of a higher principle, then these little things appear enormous. So both in friendship and forgiveness, um, the, more we, the more we cultivate this higher vision of our relationships with ourself, with others, and with God, the more we're empowered to transform ourselves and trans and help to transform others through friendship and forgiveness. That was beautiful, Maharaj. Thank you. Actually, you are beautiful. So you're <laughs> seeing everything. You're seeing beauty everywhere. Thank you. <laughs> I'm so happy you're here, Maharaj. Before we ask, before I ask the next question, I just want to say I'm so happy you're here. I'm so happy to see you. <laughs> thank you um now we know you don't have children but at the same time you have many many students that do have children and you've probably seen children being raised well and being raised poorly do you have any advice for parents on how to raise children especially like some people grow up like really sort of in they grow up, uh, they've been devotees a while, and they want, uh, the couples are devotees, and they want to raise devotee children. So that's sort of one question. But some of, some of our listeners just get into bhakti in their 40s, or in their 30s, or in their tw 50s, you know, and they're still connected with their children. Is there any general principle, or are there specific principles for what happens if you're not really in a Krishna family? What do you do? To you, what do you do with your kid? You love your kid. What's the best thing we can do in either situation? Any any advice for us struggling parents? <laughs> um, I guess the disadvantage of being a swami is we've never had biological children, mm -hmm. and the advantage is we can perceive the whole scenario from a objective perspective <laughs> yeah um but we try to see through the eyes of the saints the scriptures and the people who have been endowed with real wisdom and the principle is janasya mohogya mahama meti that The root of suffering is we're thinking in terms of I and mine, separate from our true nature, our true spiritual nature. We're thinking I am this body and those things in relationship to this body are mine. Mm. Um, in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna tells Sarva Loka Maheshwar and Suradam Sarva Bhutanam. <laughs> Ahambija Pratapita. Krishna tells, I'm this, I am the father and mother of all living beings. And this, this is a universal spiritual principle that the supreme truth is the cause of all causes, the source of everything, and the father and mother of everyone. So when we have a child, on one level, it's my child. But on a true level, this is God's child entrusted in my care. And how I raise my child is how I'm actually honoring the gift that God has, has entrusted me with. God doesn't just give us children. God entrusts his children to us. 
And when we see it from that perspective, there's a very deep sense of responsibility that's beyond our own whimsical um, likes and dislikes. <laughs> that's even beyond our habits. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I wrote this in the journey home that when I was a teenage boy, I was in the hospital and I just came out of anesthesia and my mother was standing over me with a cigarette. This is 19, early 1960s. You know, she had been smoking two packs of cigarettes a day for about 15 or 20 years. And I, and I, I, I got nauseous. I said, your cigarette's making me sick. And my mother started to cry right in front of me and she frantically snuffed out her cigarette. And she said, my, she said, my son, I promise you, I will never smoke a cigarette for the rest of my life. Mm. And she, ne she never did. <laughs> because she was thinking of her child beyond an obsessive habit that she had. And this was even before it was really understood that cigarettes were unhealthy for, <laughs> for people. It, 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 there was nothing written on the packages at that time. It was for the sake of the child. And the, the more we understand from a yoga or spiritual perspective that the art of living is that every aspect of life is an opportunity to come closer to God. And a parent's foremost responsibility is to give the best possible opportunity for the child to grow in God's light and God's grace. Sometimes it's very difficult. Um, wealth could be very difficult in raising a child to keep from spoiling them. Poverty is very difficult in raising a child. Raising a child is difficult, as far as I can see, for every parent. And it's not a matter of what's easy or what's difficult. It's how I could best give a foundation to my child's life by which they can have values wherein they could be happy under all different changing circumstances. They can grow. And ultimately, by our example, by our words, and most important, by the example we set, they understand what it really means to love unselfishly. And parents usually make more mistakes than their children make. <laughs> but we have to actually live and, and it's really good to have, it's really good for parents to have, we can call spiritual parents. <laughs> um, when, when parents have a sangam, like wisdom of the sages, <laughs> where we could actually discuss the issues with one another and help one another to, to see the best way we could be instruments of God's love if, as mothers and fathers. Mm. You have so much wisdom about parenting, Maharaj. Thank you. It's very beautiful. Thank you. Maharaj, the next question is also, uh, just as renunciates like yourself don't have children, you also don't have bank accounts and money <laughs> like the rest of us do. But the next question, but as you mentioned, you get, a, you get an um, objective perspective. So our next question is, could you please share your thoughts on money? <laughs> 
Um, one thing, uh, I'll get back to the question in a moment, okay. but as far as being objective, none of us are objects, we're all subjects. So a subject cannot really be objective. A subject <laughs> can only be subjective, but there's just you know different ways of being subjective. Different degrees, I suppose. Yeah. <laughs> um, <clears throat> money in the Srimad Bhagavatam seventh canto, Prahlad is five years old, <laughs> is teaching his classmates about Bhagavad Dharma, about the highest principles of yoga and, and, and bhakti. And he's explaining that for a person who is disconnected from their own soul and from God, he says it in this way, money is like honey. Money becomes something that's very sweet when we don't have real sweetness in our life. <laughs> we look, we look for, we look for an internal experience that we're craving for through external circumstances, and because in this world, money is. Um, so much a medium by which we can accumulate and we can control, <laughs> it becomes a serious habit. You know, practically the whole society around us is um, is orienting our way of thinking that wealth is money. But actually, wealth is happiness. <laughs> wealth is peace of mind. Wealth is meaningful relationships. Wealth is if we put all those things together, love. And in the deepest sense, love for God, love for the spirit. Um, true wealth is where there is fulfilling love. To love and to be loved. That's the wealth and the only wealth of the heart. And a, a society that has spiritual values, money facilitates that. It does not distract us from that. Money, money, money could be something that is a tremendous way of, of, of helping other people of giving our family, you know, you know, health and, and, and comforts. That's all of those things that money could buy are potentially wonderful spiritual blessings if they're in pursuit of real wealth. But unfortunately, into the, in the world today, it usually causes us to, to be greedy, depressed, jealous, envious, manipulative, exploitative, distrustful. Um, People become prisoners of their wealth. People become prisoners of their fame. <laughs> People become prisoners 
of their skills. <laughs> um, all of these things have a tremendous potential spiritual value if they're utilized in pursuance of and as an expression of the real wealth of being instruments of, of God's love in our, in our life. That was wonderful, Maharaj, and poignant and loud. And uh, I think a lot of people needed to hear that today. Maharaj, um, for a spiritualist, how is aging different? Um, a lot of times aging is sort of, uh, uh, sort of like a, 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 a death knell of like a, 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 a scary um a, a scary monster in the closet and we notice when we look in the mirror and we see our faces have changed and we look at photos of ourselves like from five years ago when we changed radically what is aging in a spiritualist and how should we understand the aging process <laughs> um Aging is a very eco-friendly process, actually. <laughs> <laughs> it's natural. <laughs> um, the more we come in contact with our own inherent nature, and the more we appreciate nature herself within creation, the more we can appreciate the beauty of creation, which very much inseparably includes aging. Mm. Because from a spiritual perspective, aging does not affect the soul. Nahanyate hanyamane sarire. Our, our true identity is we're eternally youthful. We're eternally youthful persons, part and parcel of the supreme, all beautiful person. Um, <clears throat> but within this material context, within the embodiment where the soul is encased, everything is always changing. You know, when we were little children, um, we were craving for the milk from our mother. How many of you um, have recently craved for the milk of your mother? <laughs> so so <laughs> mentally, mentally, you've completely changed. And, you know, then we may go to college, we may become, or we may learn all kinds of scriptures, or we may be very intelligent, or whatever it may be. But as we grow older, memory fades. Mm. And the physical body, you know, the, the knees don't work so well, and the lungs don't work as well, and, and our, our our face changes and our whole body changes. And, you know, when we, when we look at a beautiful flower garden, a flower garden is beautiful, but actually every day, some of those flowers are shedding their petals. <laughs> and, you know, even the great redwood trees of California, you know, they may live till 5,000 years old, but eventually the body does not last. 
but the living force within a redwood tree that lives 5,000 years old and the living force within each and every one of us is, is a beautiful part of God. And aging and death is actually really beautiful because if it didn't cause us pain, because when we're attached to the physical aspect of life, it is painful because we're losing more and more every day as we're aging. And we know that death is coming near where we're going to lose everything that we physically identify with. Now, why, why would creation be beautiful when everything and everyone has to die? Um, because the purpose of material creation is to give us an opportunity to realize the real wealth, the real joy, the real love that is inherent within us as the eternal soul. And um, in order to, to, to truly turn to God and to the soul, it has to be by our own free will. Mm. And aging um, is like a wake-up call. You know, suddenly when we see that we're getting closer to death and things aren't working so well and we're not as attractive to other people as we used to be, that could be depressing if our whole standard of happiness and meaning is on this external state of consciousness. But if we're a spiritual seeker, then the process of aging, the process of coming closer to death is, is actually a wonderful impetus to take life seriously. <laughs> Actually, we cannot really understand life without understanding death. And we can't really understand death unless we understand life. So we can take aging that, that time is taking everything away from me. Or we could take aging as God is calling me back to him. <laughs> <laughs> and each each and every one of us can interpret it either way i need to hear this thank you maharaj i need to hear this oftentimes i see old guy so, and i i look at that old guy and i think oh that poor old guy and i was like wait a second that old guy's younger than me i find out a little bit more details about the person <laughs> Oh, thank you so much, Maharaj. And I'm looking at my face in this phone right now, and I'm saying, I have a big white beard. I, uh, people must look at me and be like, look at that old guy. And in my brain, I'm still under the spell that I'm the young guy, and they're all old. I need to, I need to wake up, Maharaj. Thank you for that little gentle poke. Everything is so relative in this world, in our perceptions. I was speaking about my father who's 99 years old now. Yeah. He's approaching 100. And two of his very best friends are Yogeshwar Prabhu, <laughs> Josh Green, and Shamasundar Prabhu. Now, Shamasundar is 80 years old. My father, when he talks about Shamasundar, he talks about that young boy. <laughs> And he means it. And when, he's, when he talks about Yogeshwar, he says, oh, that young man, you know, he, uh, he's in his mid-70s. <laughs> so, you know, right now, you know, you may have, you know, a white beard and all of that. Um, of course, you know, I don't know what color mine would be if I had it. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you know, when you're a little boy, back in the 60s, there was a saying, never trust anyone over 30. 
Yeah, I don't either, Maharaj. That, that, <laughs> that, that, that was a counterculture mantra. Never trust anyone <laughs> over 30. Because we were, all teen, we were all teenagers, and 30 just seemed so old. But now when we're in our 70s, you know, people who are 30 are like little children. <laughs> so the reference point of, you know, the bodily concept of life is ever changing and it's relative to, to where we happen to be. And that's why the real beauty of life is the opportunity to understand I'm not this body <laughs> because the body mm -hmm. is subject to birth old age disease and death and you know Prahlad is speaking to his five-year-old children and his classmates and he's saying actually any one of us death could come at any moment so in that sense you could be an old man or an old woman when you're five years old if you mm -hmm. if we see that death means coming, I mean, old age is, means coming closer to death. So it's relative. And the idea of yoga is, is to harmonize the body, the mind with the spirit, with the soul, and to see from the spiritual perspective. And that's what's so beautiful about wisdom of the sages. What is the wisdom of the sages? It's to see the same things of this world from a different perspective. Mm. Um, sometimes we're thinking everything has to change around me before I can be happy. But actually, real happiness is when we change, <laughs> when our perspective changes. Mm. Is it safe to say that if there's any, you know, like sometimes I'll look in the mirror and I'll be like, oh my God, what am I dealing with today? You know, I'm just sort you see something like changing on your body or your, and, 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 is it safe to say whenever there's a little like disheartenedness with the physical appearance that, hey, Raghu, you're in Maya today. That's Maya. You are in Maya. Don't be depressed. Don't be bitter. Just accept you're in Maya and get out of it. Is it safe to say, I'm just in Maya. If I, if I see any blemish, wrinkle, nose growing, pockmark, whatever, should I just, is it safe to just say, I'm in Maya, now get over it? That's one way of, of, <laughs> of um, making progress. Um, but beyond that, just to say I'm in Maya, is a recognition of a problem. But after we recognize a problem, we have to be searching for the solutions to the problem. <laughs> um, when, when I take pleasure in Krishna's beauty, in Radha's beauty, when I take pleasure in the beauty, the greatness of God, then that's my joy in life. I'm not depending on my own very vulnerable, diminishing beauty for happiness. <laughs> when, you, when we look in the mirror and we're looking for happiness by seeing our own beauty, then it's Either today or tomorrow, we're going to suffer. <laughs> right. It's inevitable. <laughs> um, but when we look in the mirror, that this, I have the blessing of another day to appreciate God's beauty, <laughs> to celebrate God's beauty, to sh instead of trying to share my beauty with the world, I'm trying to share God's beauty, Krishna's beauty with the world then there's no, there's no end to, to our happiness. Mm. But without, because 
ananda maya vyashat. Our nature is we're seeking pleasure because that the nature of the soul is such an ananda. It's eternal, full of knowledge and full of happiness. So we're looking for happiness. So if we're not looking for happiness where real sustainable happiness is, we can't just be in limbo. We're going to look for happiness where it isn't. And if we could find some, we become very much attached to it. But then by the power, by the beauty of time, it's all taken away from us. Mm. And if time was not so merciful to, to, to take it away from us, and by seeing all around how everything and everyone is getting everything taken away, we really wouldn't have have the impetus to look for where real happiness, real peace, real love actually is. What a beautiful way to see the world. Thank you. I really needed to hear this today. Thank you, Maharaj. You know, you know, just this morning I was in our little gar, I'm in Mumbai now, um, India. And actually today is Ram, no Ram Nomi. It's the appearance day of, of Lord Rama. And we're having a big celebration in the temple. I have all the doors closed because there's kirtans going on in the next room. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I was just in a garden. I was looking at a, a beautiful bird singing. And this bird was singing so sweetly a very exotic voice. Um, and the bird, as the bird was singing, I was looking in, in his or her eyes, I can't tell. Um, just glossy, just looking, the eyes of that bird was like just celebrating life. Now, I know that bird within a couple of years is going to be dead because birds, those little birds don't live that long. So am I going to be lamenting because that bird's soon going to die? Or am I going to be celebrating because that bird is so full of life? And when we understand from the perspective of, of the soul, from the perspective of God's vision that he's that he's giving us through the wisdom of the sages, um, then even in the saddest situations of life, we have, a, we have an opportunity to do something good. We have an opportunity here in India, you know, if we look at the poverty and diseases of some places, we could really be depressed. Mm -hmm. But we could also see that these are eternal souls, and I'm an eternal soul, and we're all God's children, and whatever I have, let me share with them to, to help make them happy. Then even in the suffering, there's, there's an inner joy in that we could try to make a difference. And if that's an ego thing, then it's selfish. Mm -hmm. But if we see that we're all we're all God's children entrusted with whatever we have to share with each other, then that joy is a deeper reality than the superficial sufferings. I don't know if that makes any sense, but um, I hope that addresses your question. Thank you, Maharaj. Of course, this you're wonderful and you're beautiful. <laughs> um, last time I looked in the mirror, it didn't look like that. <laughs> <laughs> but if you're seeing my soul, then I, <laughs> then I, actually when we see our own soul, or to the, to the degree we can appreciate our own spiritual identity, 
to that degree, the world around us is a mirror of our own consciousness. Wow. Wow. When, when Krishna says in Gita, one who sees me everywhere and everything in me, that person is truly close to me. How do we see God everywhere? When we see God within our own hearts, then the world is a mirror that reflects the Lord within the world around us. And that doesn't make us callous to other people's suffering. It doesn't make us callous to other to, to the way people exploit nature or each other, but it gives us the hope of the potential that's there everywhere. Marge, people are saying on the message board, boy, I have to listen to this again. There's, this is such dense, important information. Like, I want to hear everything you said again, because my head is sort of like <laughs> reflexant, intelligent thoughts. And it, I, I need to hear this again to let it sink in. Thank you so much for this. Kostuba, back to you. <laughs> Marsh, um, two days ago in, in the United States, there's a, a, re a recurring tragedy happened where, you know, um, someone, you know, went into a school you know, with guns, they shot children, they shot the staff. Uh, this, here in America, this is a regular occurrence. And um, regularly, the, you know, the politicians are pitted against each other. And because they're so pitted in, against each other, they have no answer for what to do. And, and their stock answers, you know, we offer our prayers for the, for the victims and for their families. And, um, you know, people, I think, rightly feel frustrated. They say, well, what good are these prayers? These prayers are not doing anything. Um, it, it's, it, it can sound like a very, just like a step bypassing the, the, the issue. But as, a, as a, a bhakti yogi, as a true contemplative, mm. uh, could you speak about what is prayer? You know, in its, in its you know, uh, most authentic way. What is what is prayer really all about? I'm I'm thinking in a way that I've never thought before in one sense in this regard. The analogy of there's eating nourishing food. Mm. But what is the use of eating nourishing food if we don't use that nourishment to do something? <laughs> so in one sense, prayer is a nourishing, if, if it's done properly, if we're praying for the right things, um, but it doesn't mean much unless beyond our prayers, we, we live our life prayerfully. Um, it, to be an activist means we really care. And yes, prayer is a good thing if we're praying for, for the well-being of others, if we're praying for God's blessings upon others, that's always good. That's... But in the, in the path of bhakti, we're not only praying for blessings upon ourselves and blessings upon others, but we're praying for the blessing so that I can serve, 
so that I could make sacrifices so that we can actually be a part of the solution. And, you know, there are so many social illnesses in the world today, whether it's climate change or violence, crime, addiction, racism, prejudice. But the real solutions are not just through some legislative patchwork um, that's going to change in time. <laughs> The real solutions are, can only be in the change of hearts. And how we can change the hearts of others, change the values of others. Um, we become empowered to the extent we change our own hearts. Lord Chaitanya prayed, Nadanam Najanam Nasundarim Kavitam Vajagadisha Kamaye, Mama Jan Mani Jan Manishwari, Bhavatad Bhakti Rohoita Gitwai. My dear Lord, I do not pray for money. I do not play for, pray for physical pleasures or fame. I don't even pray for liberation from suffering. I pray that I could serve, be an instrument of your love by dedicating my life to serving you and serving your children, birth after birth after birth, according to your wish. So yes, when we see these things happening, it naturally makes us angry. It naturally makes us sad, brokenhearted. But it should also activate us to be the change that we want to see in this world. And as far as my own heart, I, I want to sincerely congratulate your 1,000th one, 1, um, podcast today, <laughs> Wisdom of the Sages. Um, and this is exactly what you're trying to do, Kostuba Prabhu and Raghunath Prabhu is is you have received something that has changed your life and something that throughout the ages, all the saints and rishis and avatars have declared to be the most necessary solution to all the ills of the world is a positive change of heart. Yeah. And that's what wisdom is. Wisdom is seeing beyond just the, the um, external appearance of things and go, going to the deeper root cause of what the problem really is and what the solution really is. Um, that's what wisdom is. That's what the sages have taught us since the beginning of time. <laughs> um, but you have received it and you're activists in the sense that you really want to share it. You know, in my own personal life, my beloved guru, Srila Prabhupada, he was living in Brindaban at the age of 69 or 70. He wanted to share the beauty of, the, of knowledge of the eternal soul beyond birth and death. He wanted to share the beauty of Krishna consciousness or God consciousness as, as a true solution to, to, 
to the problems of greed and fear and arrogance of this world and all the in all the various ways they manifest. Um, <clears throat> and he sat in New York City in the Lower East Side on Second Avenue. Sometimes he sat under a tree in Tompkins Square Park, just wanting to share it. And here all of us are. We want to share what we have received. The, the greatest way of expressing gratitude is to receive by following the, to our best abilities and then sharing it with others. So, you know, protests and marching in the streets and, and, and all these other things, they may or may not make a difference. <laughs> but what is at the very core is unless we help people to rise above their fears, their, their emotional bad habits, their their material conceptions and their egoistic conceptions, unless we can help to show people that there is something beyond that. And here it is. And here's how we can experience it. Then we're, we're actually addressing the real solution to the real problems. And sometimes we can be discouraged that, you know, that there's so, so many people who are lost in, in like this tsunami of material energy. What difference will wisdom of the sages make? <laughs> um, Srila Prabhupada's guru, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati Prabhupada, he used to say, if even one person comes closer to God through my whole life's mission, then that's a great success in life. If we can take, if we can touch one person's heart with with a deeper sense of true bhakti, then our life has immeasurable success. Mm -hmm. But to speak, if we could reach two or three or a thousand or a million or 10 million, mm -hmm. but the more we care, the more we'll try. This is activism. And the ills of this world, yes, they sadden us, but they should also activate us. Mm. It's like the ongoing theme, isn't it? The sadness of this world should all activate us, although they sadden us. My aging is like that. Even the next question on do we have time close to but can we ask another question I, I was thinking because i know that you have to to take your kids to school i know maraj has a, a temple packed full of people waiting for him maybe we could ask just one more i was thinking maybe jump to the last question the last question on 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 oh man there's so many good there's so many great ones maraj we could do this all day with you will you just <laughs> stay with maraj here in india it's night <laughs> <laughs> we could do this all night with you, Maharaj. I first met you, Maharaj, at New Vrindavan, and we, we, we got in late from a band performance, and you welcomed us. You welcomed our band in 1996, and you stayed up all night with us and told us the journey home, and that was years before it ever came out, and we sat on the edge of our seats. And I'll never forget that magic day. I met you in 1996. Yeah, after you 
after you played with your band, I I saw that you need some you needed some bandaging. <laughs> Bandage my broken heart. Thank you, Maharaj. <laughs> um, how about on bhakti, on devotion? What are your comments on devotion for all of us? You know, we have a whole plethora of different types of people that get into this. Some people know nothing and they just scr- they stumble upon this podcast searching through spiritual podcasts. Some people have been into bhakti. Some people are from India. Some people are from the, the punk rock music scene. What universal thing can you say about bhakti that's sort of like that we can all apply, even though we're coming from a, a different, uh, different pathways in life? Um, there are different places in life. What's the universal thing and, and maybe some tips of how to make rapid advancements because uh, time's running out. <laughs> the word bhakti means the highest potential within all of us, mm. which is unmotivated and uninterrupted love for God. And when we water the root of the tree, naturally that water extends to every part of the tree, the flowers, the leaves, the branches. So similarly, when we awaken and recognize the love for God that is the inherent nature of our very soul, our very being, then it naturally extends everywhere to everyone. Um, And that is the highest potential of life. Bhakti yoga is the means, the method, the process in which we access and can directly communicate with the the love of God that is within us. And that's the greatest need in the world. It's not a sectarian idea. It's at the heart of all true spiritual paths, this idea of bhakti, this idea of of divine love. Um, Krishna consciousness means to be conscious that of our own relationship with God and everything in everyone's relationship with God. To live in a spirit of service, to cultivate the idea of compassion to overcome our own selfish tendencies. To meet and discuss with one another, which is called satsang. To to enliven, empower each other by discussing the subjects that bring out the divinity from within us. Mm -hmm. The whole world is so full of gossip and so full of fault finding and so full of just wasted words. Um, Satsang is the positive alternative. We don't want to waste our life through wasted words. We want to speak what's productive. <laughs> we want to speak what, what helps each other grow, to actually be friends. Um, and chanting God's names, kirtan, is the most highly recommended process in all of the Vedic literatures and all the yogic scriptures for um, achieving the perfection of this love, this this love of God. Um, This mantra, this chanting of spiritual sound vibration um, awakens the innermost um, potential of the heart and awakens the nature of the soul. When we chant individually, um, it connects us with Krishna, with God. And when we do it together in kirtan, it, um, 
it unites all of our hearts as a as a combined offering of mm. love for the supreme and compassion for the world. And in this way, it's a prayer, but it's a prayer that is that is activating the souls of all the world. We always have to wait a long pause because we don't know if more wisdom is about to come. <laughs> there, if the wait there is going more to come, to, but, is that we're at a period or is that a dot dot dot? <laughs> Maharaj, you know, um, we're so grateful and it's so appropriate that you joined us for this 1000th episode. Mm -hmm. um, you, you mentioned that we've been given something special in our lives and really what we're trying to do with Wisdom of the Sages is to share that people. And really, that's exactly what we're doing. It's because, you know, Raghunath and I feel like the blessing of the experiences that we begin with life in, in life, like knowing you and, and, and um, hearing from you has brought a kind of a, a, a beauty, a magic into our lives. Uh, and really what we're just trying to do with Wisdom of Sages is share that with other people. And so to have you here, your primary influence in our lives, primary influence in, in what we're trying to do here. Um, I just want to thank you for being here. Uh, I think Raghunath and I both want to thank you and, and, and take this opportunity also to thank the hundreds of people that came here with us live today and the thousands of people that listen every day. Um, Thank you all for, for taking part in this and uh, for being part of it. You, you all mean so much to us. Thank you, Maharaj. Raghunath, do you'd like to share a few thoughts? Yeah, I, I really want to thank Maharaj for being really from the get-go, from our first episode, you know, Maharaj was with yeah. us um, at the Govardhan Eco Village. And um, I love uh, the fact that we started this entire podcast at the Govardhan Eco Village and was with Maharaj the whole time. And he's been such... To, he's been such a compass in our life, a directing true north force in our life. I want to thank you, Kostuba, for being there. I feel uh -huh. like this always been great friends, but I feel like um, we've become closer and closer and like our our, our, our our souls and our minds have been interwoven like a beautiful, like a beautiful rope that we weave <laughs> together, you know, and I want to thank Mara who does so much behind. I see what Mara does behind the scenes and it's, yeah. it definitely takes up a bunch of time in her life. And she's been doing it very steady. And there's a, there's a beauty in steadiness and just showing up on a regular basis. I want to thank Mara. I want to thank these people that tune in regularly because we see their faces. And to me, that, that face gives me some like connection with the community we have here. And also I want to thank the others, the ones we don't see on a regular basis. But sure enough, they listen on a regular basis. And that's very, very impressive as well. So uh, to, to our next 1000 episodes. Thank you very much. I also want to thank this can't, couldn't be possible with all the, all the people that contribute to us because yeah. this is how we're living right here. And so right. all the contributors, Patreon page, thank you so much. Um, uh, it's a community supported. You go to patreon.com slash wisdom of the sages. Thank you for your, any, any monthly donation. It, it really helps. Um, Brudge Bihari does lots of help behind the scenes. And um, we have so many wonderful people in our life. Thanks for this entire community. And that's all. I, I just want to make a couple announcements. Um, uh, Wisdom of the Sages Retreat, May 24th, is almost sold out to May 27th. If you haven't seen that, go to our events page. That's at Super Soul Farm. And with, with His Holiness Satchinandana Swami is going to be there. And we have day passes. Wisdom of the Sages in Italy, 2023, June 27th to July 4th. That's happening. 200 hour uh, that's on our events page on our website 200 hour bhakti yoga teacher training at super soul farm july 13th through the 28th and um that's with me and cindy and bobby at super soul farm just go to my link tree on my instagram you can find out everything's going on the farm and everything we're doing with this in the stages as well and now there's the one Thanks. at uh the new york rathiatra retreat that we do every year it's up on the bhakti center's website Okay, and you go to the Bhakti Center, and I think it might be up on our website too. I'm not positive about that, but it's going up 
And that's over Ralph Piazza. We do it at the Bhakti Center. That's a really great. This is be the third time we have our whole program at the Bhakti Center. And then we take everybody on a field trip and we march down, what is it, Fifth Avenue? Like we own the place. <laughs> like Krishna <laughs> the place. I guess if there's material consciousness, they like we own the place, but like Krishna owns the place. And Krishna does. He is Manhattan, Manhattan Nath, the Lord of Manhattan. And it's just a special festival and we're looking forward to seeing everybody there. Thank you again, Maharaj. Thank you, Raghunath. And thank you, Maharaj, for coming, spending this time. Your time is so precious that you spend so much of it with us uh, is so much appreciated. Actually, I just for the first time discover these jets and I'm looking at some of them. <laughs> you are all such wonderful people. <laughs> <laughs> Mary, you want to? Oh, go. Yeah. I'm sorry, Marsh. Continue. That was a period, not a dot, dot, dot. I was gonna... <laughs> okay. Thank you again. Thank Everybody. you so very much. I wish you all happy Ram Nomi and I congratulate all of wisdom of the sages for your 1,000th podcast. This is it's extraordinary. It's extraordinary what you are doing, what you have done, and what's most extraordinary is what you will do. <laughs> Hopefully well, we will serve you, Maharaj. What a morning. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. I'm all smiles today. Very cool. Show today. You have a commitment to fun. Round of chopper today. Make that commitment to yourself right now. It's a great way to attend. <laughs> Somehow we can't hear you, Ragnar. When the music comes on, it just. You can... I don't know you hear me now. Yeah, you gotta get real close. I think <laughs> we can... you hear me we're now. a very close up view of your face. Commitment to chanting Chapa today. What do you say about that? <laughs> very exciting. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this guy. It's a beautiful day for a beautiful day, everyone. Let the magic continue to flow.